Hello. Here's what I promised. We're going to talk about constrained inversion. We're going to talk and interpret that and give the final solution, or as the journals call it, the end losing. For the underdetermined problem, I will show you the homework, which is a nonlinear problem, which I can hopefully briefly introduce, because the way to solve it is to linearize it, which means differentiate ones. Don't solve for the parameters, but solve for the parameter updates. And um, then you do the same thing you've already done. So in a way, it's really easy, but it's a new thing to wrap your minds around. Probably not today. And I'm going to wrap up with Bayes, who appeared in lecture one, and who will now make a reappearance in a way that we're going to just simply recognize. All right. So constraining inversions. Here's a thing that you definitely want to do. And I'll give you just the briefest of motivations. So here's what you definitely want to do at some point, right? You've got some data. And let us go back to our simplest polynomial dependence. And let us look for some sort of a usual y is ax plus b type of thing. And that's a d equals gm type of thing. And you'll say, sure, so the model is that exactly this y is ax plus b plus a noise term remember that's the thing that we know nothing about except we're stipulating it has zero mean is uncorrelated with what we want to know it may have a certain variance we can check that upon success and we're going to try and find an a and a b such that a minus ax minus b ultimately is equal in norm to the norm of the noise. This is yet one more way of saying it, right? When we're done, nothing new here. We're getting residuals and some estimates, or rather some residuals made with some estimates. This is our prediction. This is our residual. When done, we have a hat, b hat, the estimates. And least squares, which is what we've been doing all along, is saying that the norm of the residual is sort of commensurate, fancy word, with the norm of the noise. That's already a statistical interpretation that already talks about the chi square, that already talked about the sums of squares and the distribution of it and so on. I'm not going to repeat it, but I, in fact, I have just repeated it, right? We want this to be commensurate and when I say least squares I'll call it L2 right and then we talk about least squares so I have not actually ever written it like this in so many words so here's just you know one more way of seeing these problems but new twist since we have more data than parameters since you also know how to incorporate data uncertainty, since you know that the best way of data uncertainty incorporation for Gaussian distributions of noise is to incorporate them as the inverse of the covariance matrix, that's all old hat. I want to go now to the mental regime where you have one data point that you are so sure about that you say it just must go through this point, okay? I like to think of that as saying, it's a constraint, it's gotta go through this point. Or I could say, compared to any of the other uncertainties, this one is so small that it's zero, that I want to give this an enormous weight, one over zero being enormous. And however I play it, I need to get my best fitting line through that point, but of course I need to redefine what it means best fitting because I can't just go through this thing on the right because that would give me, you know, this, let's say, as a best fitting line in the traditional sense, that would be A and B derived, right? So now I'm saying make an estimate, try your best, 
but force at minimizing the residuals in the traditional sense. But here's the new twist. Force at this point, x star needs to be y star. Force to point x star y star to lie on the solution. So graphically, I'm going to try to do my second best as long as the line actually goes to this point. And I'll mentally separate these things by saying, I'll just call them a half star and a and b half star. That's my new solution. That's an example. Let's speak more generally. And by the way, you see this example, you know, I don't know, I can think of an economic thing where you're saying, I gotta fit this thing, but you know, I need to make sure that this happens or isn't exceeded or is exactly some value or something like this. But also in science, you might want to just completely emphasize something. You could also ask a question, which, which line fits best without uh, ever going negative in the sense that you want the intercept to be positive or things like that. So let me just very generally speak. And remember our, our general misfit is called phi. And as you know, phi is a function that depends on the data and it's a function that depends on the model and it takes a particular form. Right now, I'm not talking about a quadratic form, I'm just talking about phi. So phi depends as usual on data and on the unknown model parameters. And we have uh, given many examples. And we know that we're going to have some sort of a gradient where we need to consider the gradient, which one, the model parameter dependent gradient, the derivatives with respect to the model parameters of this function, okay? And we want to minimize that. And here, below the line here, this is not quadratic, this is just phi. I want to tell you what phi is. So here's a general problem. I want to subject to a constraint that I want to satisfy exactly. And I can think of two constraints, two types of constraints. One of them is a scalar constraint some scalar function of my vector model parameters. And remember, if I don't underline it, it's a scalar. If I underline it once, it's a vector. If I underline it twice and usually capitalize, it's a matrix. What is this letter? It's gamma. It's a gamma. It's a capital, capital gamma. gamma. You're all well advised to print out the Greek alphabet in lowercase and uppercase. It's a gamma. And here I mean a scalar gamma, which tells me whatever some function it is, it returns a number. And my constraint is that the number is, you know, zero, let's say. That's a scalar constraint. And another example, and I'm going to write it like this, is that bold gamma or gamma once underlined. There is my correct core for it. You'll see I'll change my mind here, but I mean it's a different thing, right? It would have to be different because what I want it to mean is that it's a vector function of a vector of parameters, which satisfies a vector of constraints, okay? Or as the case may be. I'm just establishing a notation. There is a phi, I want to minimize it. There's a gamma or a gamma underline, and I want to have that be a constraint on whatever solution I come up with that otherwise minimizes the phi. Question about those constraints. So yeah. then how exactly does like a vector constraint differ from a scalar constraint? Like, is it multiple constraints or is there something else different about it? Multiple constraints is one way by which this could happen. If you think back to the earlier example where I say an apple plus a pear costs $3, I could have a vector constraint that doesn't mix apple and pear prices and says the apple is one and the pear is two. That's a vector constraint. A scalar constraint would be the apple plus the pear equals one and all cases in between. And I'm going to give you more examples. So let me draw 
another little picture. Let me just go back to one of those previous pages and so the right seeds in your heads. This is beginning to look like such a set of constraints, like the apples and the pears. Here, there's a little matrix multiplying this thing. So this particular thing, this is 1a equals 0 and 1b equals 0. That would be a sector constraint, because I have two things to add. If I had the row 1, 1, then it would be 1a plus 1b equals 0. That's a scalar constraint. I'll give you more examples. This here, I think that, that well, that, that's, that's one form, and I'll, I'll return to it. Right? And I'll be calling them something we do. So now I just want to go very, very generally and, uh, and, and draw the motivation for what is following. And I should draw a two parameter case. Okay. So this picture here, that's a data space picture. When we talk about minimizing norms and residuals, they live in the data space. That's what that is. Now I'm going to draw a model space picture. And if I'll just stick to a two parameter problem, I'll just draw, you know, the axis of the unknown parameter A and the unknown parameter B. And remember, everything we do is a mapping between spaces. And we map it through misfit functions and constraints. So some true solution, I don't even need to draw it. But I don't know it yet. Maybe I will draw it. Let's say here is the truth that I could be anywhere because I don't really know it, right? A0, B0 is the true parameter set. When we do a regular ordinary least squares, the thing that you do before you know you're doing it, you'll look at phi, which is typically quadratic. That's ordinarily squared. And phi is a function of two parameters, A and B. And the data, obviously, but I'm not writing that. Right now, I'm drawing the dependence given the data on the model parameters. And since I can't you know, color it imaginatively, I'll just draw contour lines. And I'll say phi is a certain value, phi is a certain other value, phi is a certain other value. OK, these are level sets, contours. Every one of them says phi is a value. In what we've done so far, we have, let me draw two values. Here I'm trying to get to you to the idea that our solution is the set of parameters a hat and b hat, which minimize phi. And if phi is a nice quadratic, these contours are nice looking. We could do it. All of those familiar notions come back. But now you have a graphical interpretation that you know shows you that, of course, you know, you're not going to get to the truth. You may get to the truth on average. Remember, that was the unbiased solution. And the shape of this valley is a measure of how certain you are of it. And formally, that relates to curvatures of this function, which I haven't specifically talked about. So right here, this valley of Deloitte here, there is a minimum, and I can find it. And that is my least square solution, if I is a quadratic. OK, so what's the twist now? The twist is that there is some other function. Let me draw the scalar function, gamma. I'll just draw some contours of gamma. However, they are, because I'm not actually giving you an example of gamma, but here would be gamma. Gamma is some w, some value. I make it w prime. And here is gamma equals w, some other value. Okay. That needs to be gamma. Ah, yeah, yeah. Gamma is just another function, and it contains values, and that's what it is. OK, so. If I say minimize phi, 
subject to gamma being some value, what I mean is travel on the W value contour, which I'm going to flatten a little bit, stay on it, make it so, and do your best with phi the best you can. Okay, here's my constraint. I want this to be realized, which means stay on that contour. Okay, so now my solution is going to be my a half star. And it's going to lie on the contour because I want it to. And it's going to minimize phi as much as it can while lying on that contour. So now it's this point. So we have three different points here. We have some true value. I've got an unconstrained value, which I've been doing all along. And I've got a new thing, which is A hat star and B hat star, about which I know that they minimize phi, but not free of constraint, only as much as I can do it while staying on the contour of the green gamma. And I suppose in my example here for the very, very general case, I write these things as you know, gamma needs to be zero. So my scalar function here is not really gamma, it's gamma minus W, that being zero. Or you could say W can take any value and this was the example of gamma being zero, some value. Okay, so now I need a couple more things. I need to remind you of the geometry and that is what is the gradient field of a scalar function? It's the vector that at every point quotes the two coordinate directions in which you change and shows the amount of that change. And when you plot that vector, then you get the direction in which the function changes maximally by however that amount ended up being. And by not definition, but consequence, that vector is normal to, orthogonal to, perpendicular to, pi over two radians away from 90 degrees from the contour lines. I don't think that is a surprise, but however, I remember very vividly learning this in first year college mathematics and thinking, that's cool. And so for the uh, cartographers and geologists out there, this is a mountain and these are lines of constant elevation. The local gradient is the direction in which water will run because, you know, it goes downhill. It's a local downhill, which is the way the marble rolls downhill, the water drop rolls. And so that's perpendicular to the contour. So that here is grad M phi, the field, which of course depends on M, all these little vectors. And if that's, you know, a thing I can draw, then of course I can draw grad gamma, the vector field. And I'll just draw some specific examples of grad and vectors, which show you which way gamma is increasing or diminishing. Now I'm purposely not worrying about the sign here. I'm purposely just drawing the perpendiculars, the normals, right? So that is the vector field grad in those parameters, because after all, it's a function of the parameters of gamma. Okay, and so now I'm going to maybe not clutter, but zoom in to this portion. If you drew it large enough, you could keep your drawing. I'm going to focus on my drawing for a second. My phi contour. All right. Well, I consider this a remarkably successful zoom. So here is the truth, but you know, not really accessible. Here's my original solution, and here's my new solution. And I'm barely successful, but what I want to show is that the gradient at this point of phi and the gradient at this point of gamma are collinear. I need to stay on the gamma curve because it is a constant. I need to satisfy that constraint. So away from it is bad. And wherever I land in phi, I'm going to be on some contour. 
and it is tugging me with this black vector towards the minimum because that's where I get most of my chain going towards the minimum. And the point that I settle for is the point where those pulls and pushes are you know, not necessarily balancing each other, but you know, any change in my point here would move me off the green line and that I can't have that because that, that's what it means to be subject to. And if I moved along the green line, I'd be moving away from my solution in phi. And so I settle here for this contour where the gradient of phi with respect to the model parameters is collinear with a gradient of gamma. And one way of saying it that reflects my drawing is to say that they are multiplicative versions of each other. I drew the opposite sign. And so that's like saying that they are proportional to some lambda. Okay, so that took a while, but that's the best I can do to give you a graphical intuition for what it means to minimize the constraints. And if that's the case, maybe I'll box that. Then my general problem that I have tried to address, I'll do the same thing as before here. I'll draw a big line and a title is that, you know, in a way I have, am now minimizing a new misfit, which is phi plus lambda g. Because why? Because we know the solution is that where the gradient with respect to the model parameters of that combined function is zero, which is of course what I written in the box. And because I'm speaking generally, I will write the vector form using the same language or as the case may be, I'm minimizing phi plus some sort of a bold face lambda vector, not a bold face gamma vector. That's my misfit. Ooh, that should have been green. I think you will take it from me. However, I think it's very important to map your brain onto things that are colorful. All right, and why is that? Because the solution of that, and now I'll write again, grad and phi. And now I'm going to write it as follows. Grad and gamma dot bold lambda equals bold zero. Okay, so and I'm tempted to box these guys also. Maybe this guy here, right? What does the third line say? Third line is, or as the case may be, here I had my scalar, here I had my vector, and as the case may be, it's phi plus lambda dot gamma, and the minimizer of that will be the one where the joint gradient equals zero. I'm writing it this way specifically because then I can have this appealing symmetry here between my generally speaking things where I motivate this. This is an example. This is the general case. Here, I give you a geometrical interpretation. I bring it back to the general case and I write it word for word so you see that that's the same thing and motivated by whatever I just did. Is that making sense? Yes. Uh, Frederick, I have a question. The lambda that you mentioned over there is something that we put by hand, right? Uh, when you solve the problem? Uh, yeah, so how to pick it, how to change it, what is its meaning? I'm really now beginning okay, with the geometrical okay. interpretation mm -hmm. that is intuitive, but are you getting to the point of, you know, what does it need to be? Because I'm about to show you examples and tell you exactly what it needs to be. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, how would you choose the sign? Because uh, the gradient of gamma could either be or not be in the direction of phi. Yes, and so that's where I, I'm, I'm just on my intuitive example. Okay, um, okay, okay. In the sense that, look, I took pains to draw it such way that my signs work in my favor. If you have uh, no idea what the sign is, 
you clearly wouldn't pick a sign. But of course, if you then are able to find what lambda should be, you're going to find the sign. So I'm just picking the sign in my example. Right. Okay. And also, how does this constrain the value of gamma that yeah. you're you're trying to pin down? So right now, not sufficiently. What you're saying is all true. This is not a sufficient statement, but this is part of what's going on and a geometrical interpretation. And so, you know, where is this W value, right? Is one of the things that you're saying. I kind of already said in my alternate life here, I'd say let gamma always be zero anyway, because then you, you bring the constant to the left-hand side. But so the shape and form of gamma and its various values are like all in here. And uh, I, I need, let, let me move on to the, I'm concretizing next what this implication is, because I think, I, I, I know I need to answer these questions. They are good questions, okay? Onwards. Frederick. Yeah. So for the scalar case, the equation you put a frame on is scalar on both sides, zero, I mean. Um, sorry, 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 speak again. Okay. Does that help you? Yes. Right, the great vector function, I promised you I would always underline vectors and I haven't. Yes, exactly. And here, for those of you following along, right, I have a gamma, which is a vector function and its gradient with respect to a vector parameter that turns it into a tensor. That's a stud, that's equivalent of two underlines, but the two underline dot of one underline gives you a one underline. This goes all the way back to a, a matrix vector product where you contract over adjacent indices. If this was, you know, sigma AIJ times BJ, then that would be that situation and you still have a free index. So you do have to look at that. And then I, I ask, what, thank you, because that really needs to be there. Okay. So don't forget your rank, your dimensionality. Okay. Let's do an example that is less, you know, specific than the first example I gave you, which was really a motivational example. Then I gave you an intuitive picture. Now I'm giving you a more realistic example, but still a general example. Now I say, let phi be a quadratic. And let's go back to our good old quadratic of fitting data in a linear model. G is my model. And here's my quadratic. And yes, if you want to stick a weight in there, be my guess. But I'm bringing it down again to our normal residual norm of the linear model. And what do I want to do? I want to minimize it because you all want to. Okay, so now it's a quadratic. Previously, it was just anything. The time before that, it was a quadratic. Event. And subject two, let me go back to my two examples, the scalar, or as the case may be. Here is my scalar constraint example. Here's going to be my vector constraint example. And I'll just write for good measure, or as the case may be, just to cover my is that or the other thing at the same time. And now I'm gonna say, all right, I need to give you a specific constraint and let the specific constraint be some vector F, which dot multiplies the parameter. I won't bother with the halves now. Well, maybe I will bother with the half. I'll just write the halves now. Um, all these things are, you find the argument that minimizes, you call that M half, that's your estimate. Now I'll say, you know, at that estimate, I actually specifically want that to hold. And I'll just invent a value V and a vector F, which is a way of implementing a vector constraint, which, sorry, is, well, this is a scalar constraint. Why? Because I implemented by a vector dot product with the parameter vector. Next, bold F, doubly underlined, as a matrix, which then leads to a set of values V, which is a vector, which gives me a bold 
O underline zero. Okay. So here, you know, that's that. And now watch me write this. So now I go to the solution. I'll pick, I'll do the scalar case. And I say, you know, remember the solution. Well, we know the solution is if something's maximized in my geometric intuition and collinear, then I have the gradient of this thing. So I solve now the zero vector and I want this to be, I want the gradient with respect to these model parameters of the V minus GM dot D minus GM. I'm just copying it here. So in other words, the grad phi plus lambda times my gradient of my vector constraint with respect to their parameters. So that just brings out F, the lowercase bold face vector, not M. I'm taking my hats back. But I'll close it here. Totally have changed my mind. I'm taking the hats back because I still want to differentiate. I haven't found anything yet. While when I find it, it will be true. When I haven't found it yet, I'm not going to claim I've already found it. Also, I need to get, okay. This is what I want. I follow through. I differentiate. I get G transpose times D minus G dot N, which of course you'll recognize from the first time we did uh, inversion, plus lambda times F. And uh, one more thing that I wanted to say is that this here, right? There's your least squares again, right? It's a quadratic constraint. We've done plenty of examples that kind of looked like this, where we've implemented a quadratic constraint on the model parameters. That was the whole thing where we are saying prior information, and to bring it back into your active memory, all these times we have written things like this, right? You need to see that that was a quadratic, quadratic type of situation. We didn't talk about it as constraints and so on, but you know what, like expressions like this, quadratic, quadratic have appeared. This is page 41. Here now, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that these things, scalar or vector, these are linear constraints because it's a little f, a vector or a big F, a matrix that implements some kind of a linear condition. So this thing needs to be that transpose plus two GTG to that. And so I need to solve this, but here is part of your answer, I suppose. Not only does this need to happen, I also need to happen, have happen that V is what I claim is my constraint. So here's where gamma and its value come back. I need that simultaneously. Okay. And if I do this, I now want to write it in yet a third form that I want you to start recognizing. And that is I'm gonna write it in a big matrix form. I'm gonna just read it. I'm gonna make a slight jump such that you see it coming, I suppose. I'm gonna write this as follows in a way that you haven't seen yet. GT dot D and G transpose dot G and F transpose and M and little V and F not transposed and filling the corner with zeros and keeping my parameter and dividing it by two to take this. So I want you to see that that's equivalent 
And one way of seeing it is, well, look, if I didn't have the constraint, my F is zero. If I don't have the constraint, it's just like this, right? D equals GM in least squares. When we did the derivative before, we encountered it sort of in this form, but not really written it this way. Is equivalent to saying GTD equals GTG times M. And then our solution was M hat is GTG inverse GTD, which is what the only equation I ever claim I remember. That needs to happen. But look at the thing above my, I don't have enough fingers now, three lines above it, right? So now I say, yep, well, that'll be true, but also I need to multiply F and M. And here is the unfortunate matrix notation, you know, F dot M, which appears here. That's F dot M, that's just a dot product. If I write as a matrix product, in this case, I need F transpose M. Okay, so now that's there. And then I'm saying I got an extra one, which has V equals F dot M plus nothing times that. That's what I want you to recognize, that that makes sense. I don't understand the lambda over two term. Where did that come from? From here, there is that two here. When I didn't have the lambda to worry about, I ignored the two because I needed to just maximize it and the two didn't matter. But here, if I write the equality, then I end up with two. So, um, it's going to come back. I want to press a little bit forward, but there's only a 10 minutes. I think what, what's best now is for me to write that I'm going to concretize this particular thing into the specific example. So this was a general example that followed my general rules and sort of wrote it all sort of generally, but you don't quite see it yet. I do want to point out that if there's no constraints, we're simply back to GM equals D and its solutions, which you write a gradient, you differentiate, you end up with this. And then we didn't usually bother writing it in this form because you know we didn't need to, it's just a simple equality. Now I augmented this system to reflect the constraint and the specific value. And so now I'm claiming that's the same. And you know, I'm not really arguing that's the same right now, other than by saying pretend it's not there, then it's the same as what you knew before, okay? We're back to the old case and it's good old solutions. You need to see that it's not a departure from what you know already. Uh, Frederick? Yeah. Uh, could you explain uh, why, the, why the zero term in the matrix is a tensor? Let me, let me just, I, I'm not sure, so let me walk myself through it, okay? It looks like I have picked F to be a row vector, which means you are, again, right, this is overzealous tensorization. But when I return to big F, you'll see this will be vector V. This will be fat bold doubly on the line F, this will be F transpose and that will be that tensor again. Thank you, it was wrong. It needs to be whatever it needs to complete. And it's a row, which is somewhat counter to my usual notation, but you stick zeros in. So it's a row vector, okay. Oh no, sorry, it's, um, oh, what is it? Um, yeah, it should be what it was because F transpose and F, they yeah. have, uh, Complementary dimension. So it has to be a square matrix of zeros. Yeah, I think I'm talking myself into a, a trap here. So the little V needs to be an F dot M plus, you know, the, the whatever, however many nothings I need. And my, um, this here is a, um, M by M is a, it's a model space dimension matrix, right? And so this is a row, is a column. 
Um, can I just sort of uh, fake it for now and say it'll be, uh, we'll see it when we do the, the examples again and then we'll, we'll fix it. I'm a little bit staring at it right now. I'll just delightfully make it undetermined by writing the two things here really close together, okay? It'll come out like you, there's no way that you can do it wrong because you can't fill a matrix with the right thing. But I'll, we need to get back to this. Um, Thanks. So, but, but you need to point these things out. I'm happy you do because that needs to be right. The specific example that I want to return to is again, the constrained fitting of a straight line. That's what I opened with. That needs to just sort of fall into place. Maybe I'll end here with that uh, ultimately so that you uh, have the concrete example which you can actually try. I'm writing this because we only have a few minutes left and I want you to be able to try it. And uh, Menke talks about this, obviously. Here's your data, M data. Here's your matrix G. Remember that matrix G for a fitting of a straight line is just ones. And wherever you have collected the data, and you think that there is an offset and a linear dependence. And when I said alpha is the polynomial degree, my alpha is one. And my M's, they be A and B. The constraint, I think we're going to be able to fix our zeros also. What is my constraint? My constraint was that. Remember, the stars need to go through a particular point. And I now realize that I had, this would be the A plus B X, but I have A X plus B. So I'm gonna make that B in this A. Okay. What's my constraint? My constraint is the following. One times B plus some specific X star needs to multiply my model vector DNA. And that needs to be equal to my Y star. That's what I say needs to happen. And I'm gonna go look at the equations here. I'll return to this. So now this is when the chickens are coming home to root, right? I will give this equation plug it into the matrix equation, I'll just say, with a delightful suspense, whether the zero needs a double or a single underline. And we'll, that'll be on Thursday. And there we are. I didn't deliver on my promise here. I went into constraint, yes. I still owe you to finish this example. And I still owe you to generalize it to the matrix case, to the vector constraint, which I'm going to use when we do the underdetermined problem, which will then give you a whole new class of solutions, which you'll be looking at and understanding. I'll return to this and you'll have an example that you can do in the process. We are also going to call it by its name where this lambda is a Lagrange multiplier. And we're going to also find explicit expressions for it. I am overrunning and I realize that I'm just gonna maybe write this here because I know you need it. And then it's just boring to write it out and it just takes a minute here. We know we need these sums of squares, right? The GTG. And I'm just gonna write it so we have it handy when we need it. This is the sort of stuff that Menke loves to write out in his book. This here needs to be, oh, and this was M, M parameters. So G transpose G is gonna sum over all the ones M as there are. And then you're gonna get the sum of all the X's. Do that twice. And then you'll get the sum of the X squares. And uh, I'm going to use that and start sticking this in and work this out further. So I apologize for leaving you at a little bit of a frayed 
edge here. I have not usually done that, but in order to respect the time, I'm going to go open with that on Thursday. I've reached a point where I know I need to finish and I don't see it anymore, right? This is this F here is this here now. Oh, I'm not showing it, right? So F is a row vector. Yeah. And F transpose is a column vector. Actually, now I'm gonna do that. It's a scalar, the zero should be a scalar. Yeah. yeah, in this case it is. And so I'll begin by acknowledging that next time. And I realize that when I write this notation, the F dot N, I don't really need to care about it. I really do need to care about it if it's a row or a column. Once I picked, you know, everything else, that's a slight confusion between these notations and the notations where you actually need the transport because you're sticking it into a vector. And what I should have done is say with F a row, that's how I can most get away with this mixed notation. And then remember, this is a row because I really only have one value. This is a column. And then I only really need one element. This is a number. But when big F is a matrix and this is a vector, this is gonna have the right dimensions. And so in general, I'll, I write, you know, little fat O's. 